These new products, in addition to broadening Europeans' horizons and introducing them to a whole bunch of different technologies and luxury goods from Asia, also brought significant wealth and trade to European cities like the quintessential port city of Venice. Venice became rich and powerful, and all of these new goods and ideas flowed back into Europe. All of this led to significant population growth. New technology and wealth led the population of Europe to grow, which led farmers to expand onto what we call marginal lands, which are lands that you probably shouldn't be farming if you have any other chance. They're generally rocky, they don't get a, or they don't get enough precipitation, or the soil quality is pretty poor. And so Europe starts to stretch its capacity to feed itself, which is really never a good idea because, as you can see, things are going to go down here in just about a minute. So the crisis of the 14th century leads to the total collapse of, of medieval society. First, you've got the Hundred Years War. It's ostensibly a war between France and England, and it doesn't, there's not a hundred years of consistent fighting, but what it does introduce, it, it does create a lot of death. It drains the treasuries of both sides. Joan of Arc gets to show up and like wave a flag and inspire the French people. But most importantly, it introduces the English longbow, which completely destroys the military order. With the English longbow, any peasant with a bow can kill a noble or a knight who's armored on horseback. And so rather than having to pay to outfit a whole bunch of knights and horses, which are super expensive, instead you get peasants with bows who then just can rain arrows down on them. And so, now, the military aristocracy starts to fall apart. The Black Death also shows up, and we'll talk about that later. There's a whole a number of years of brutal, uh, of brutal drought, followed by massive flooding, which wipes out a lot of those marginal farmlands and leads to a huge famine in Europe, which kills a lot of people. Then you've got the destruction of the legitimacy of the popes. The, 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 the Great Schism, of the church or the, the, the Avignon papacy leads, uh, so a disagreement over who's gonna be pope leads to two popes, one in Rome, one in Avignon in France, both of them claiming to be the universal pope and the, uh, and the, the only representative of God. Then the church calls a council to attempt to, uh, to, to attempt to solve this problem and pick between the two popes. They end up choosing a third pope and none of the three popes agree to step down. So this becomes really problematic because now you've got a whole bunch of people claiming to be God's divine representative and they disagree with each other about a whole host of different things. So what's the effect of this on Europe? Well, one, the Catholic Church loses a lot of faith and face because, I mean, they can't even figure out who the Pope is, which, you know, pretty embarrassing. This is coupled with something called conciliarism, where all of these popes, in order to get different people to recognize them, agree to give up the authority to appoint church officials and bishops. So, for example, the Pope in Rome then gives the King of France the authority to appoint French bishops, and so now the Pope no longer has the ability to choose who the church officials are going to be, which increases the power of kings and decreases the power of popes, weakening the sort of universal power of the Catholic Church. Then, in order to raise money, because of course all of these popes have lost significant portions of their estate, the, the church decides to more or less try to make money out of the appointment of church offices. They take huge bribes from wealthy families like the Medici, who we're going to feature prominently in our story here in the future, allowing them to choose and appoint their own family members into high church, of, into high church offices, and even sometimes picking the pope, which again, not ideal. The policy of simony, this uh, selling of church offices, becomes widespread. And so you get a whole bunch of high church officials who aren't particularly interested in like theology or running the church and instead have bought their offices and now are trying to use them to make money. And so for the average person, these, these, bis these bishops uh, don't provide much religious guidance and instead just try to squeeze as much money out of the population as they can, which further erodes the faith in the church. And then you've got the Black Death. The bubonic plague has been around for a long time in various iterations. Uh, it crushed the Roman Empire a number of different times, including uh, and the Byzantine Empire as well. This iteration came into uh, Europe through Italy, most likely from fleas on rats, and it was incredibly virulent and deadly. So you start getting these buboes showing up on your, some of your glands, then you have breathing constriction, seizures, and then within three days, you could go from healthy to completely dead. 
the bubonic plague wiped out whole cities and uh, led people to flee to, uh, to the countryside, leading to the further spread of the plague. And then, during the pneumonic phase of the plague, it went airborne and stuff really fell apart. In the end, generally somewhere between a half, a quarter to maybe a half of the European population died of the bubonic plague, which, as you hopefully, as you hopefully know, will lead to societal collapse regardless of all of these other crises. So, those are the various things that led the Middle Ages to end and transitioned us into the phase that we call the Renaissance. So, hopefully you can answer these objective questions. Thank you for listening.